Mythicists look long and hard for examples of gods who were euhemerized, that is, had fiction written casting them as historical figures, as possible precedents for the theory that Jesus was a euhemerized god and never a real man. The examples they have come up with are, at least to my mind, not convincing. However, there is one under our noses that was given to us by the same people who told us about Jesus, and that is the post-resurrection Jesus. Our earliest source is Paul, and the only Jesus he is familiar with is the post-resurrection Jesus. He gives us some prior details, specifically that he was crucified, and he makes a few references to the pre-crucifixion Jesus whose meanings are debated. Most of what he tells us about the nature of his post-resurrection Jesus comes from 1 Corinthians 15, here starting in verse 3. For I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, last of all, as though to one born at the wrong time, he appeared also to me. He appears to these people. They don't bump into him or go looking for him. Jesus is the active party appearing to them, rather than them being the active party perceiving Jesus. And that suggests a spiritual or visionary experience, rather than seeing somebody walking around. There is no difference between Jesus' appearance to Paul, after he had ascended into heaven, and to Peter et al. while he was still walking around on earth. Paul makes no such distinction, which suggests that Paul saw all these appearances as being of the same essential nature. Paul is our most honest New Testament writer. You cannot catch him in a lie. He doesn't recount any supernatural occurrences that we wouldn't believe, merely making reference to non-specific signs. Christians make much of appearing to 500 at one time. Hallucinations when they occur are usually private, making simultaneous hallucinations to 500 remotely unlikely, but that's not the likely explanation. This is something that Paul really heard, but its origin cannot be known. It presumably evolved in oral tradition before being reported to Paul. Later in the chapter, Paul turns to the question of physical versus spiritual bodies. This is discussing the bodies of believers, but the verses I skip make it clear that the same process applied to Jesus, who was the first fruit of the resurrection. Here's a question to consider as I read. We know that the gospel resurrection of Jesus was associated with the disappearance of his body. Does Paul's view of resurrection require the disappearance of the earthly body? Verse 39 all flesh is not the same. People have one flesh, animals have another, birds and fish another, and there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the heavenly body is one sort and the earthly another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. It is the same with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man Adam became a living person, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, made of dust, the second man is from heaven. Like the one made of dust, so too are those made of dust, and like the one from heaven, so too those who are heavenly. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. Paul emphasises that the resurrected body is not just a new body, but a body of a different type, made from different stuff. So the stuff in the old body cannot be recycled to make the new. This doesn't exclude the old body disappearing in the production of the new. There could, I suppose, be some kind of lost wax type process in which the old body is used as a pattern for the new. 
in a mould of clay, of course, and maybe a casting alloy of truth, righteousness, gospel, faith, salvation and the spirit. As we know, those materials are used in the production of spiritual military hardware. Going on with verse 50, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blinking of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So, does then Paul's resurrection reuse or consume the earthly corpse? It's not clear. In verse 53, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality, suggests that the corpse does have some role to play. On the other hand, the different bodies are made of different stuff, and flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. This gives obtuse and inconsistent answers to the question, which can mean one thing. The question of the role of the earthly body in the resurrection, so central to the Gospel accounts, never occurred to Paul. Paul mentions the Holy Spirit a lot. He doesn't give a compare and contrast section like this, but it seems as though Paul had a theology where a spirit was an omnipresent influence or power. A spiritual body was similar in form to a physical body but made of spiritual stuff that could reveal itself in vision but had the discretion to make those revelations rather than turning up whenever asked or being sought out. All of which suggests that these spiritual bodies cannot be seen walking around the earth like normal bodies but have specific coordinates in heavenly space rather than being omnipresent like the Holy Spirit. That means Paul's post-resurrection Jesus was strictly spiritual. He was distinct from the Holy Spirit in having the spiritual form of a man, but was still a component of the spirit realm, not the temporal realm. And these properties were unchanging from the resurrection onwards, and were at no point altered by an ascent into heaven. Now let's turn to the Gospels. From Mark, we understand that the pre-crucifixion Jesus was a physical human with a few extra powers. He was located in geographical space, historical time, and associated with known historical figures. He ate, he drank, he slept in the boat before calming the storm, he spat in the course of healing miracles, he was perishable in that he died. He does not bleed in Mark, but he does touch. He does not use the toilet, but he does talk about such functions in Mark 7.19, when talking about what does and does not defile a person. He can also read minds, perform miracles, including by remote control, walk on water and forgive sins. So, a gaudy type of man. Mark tells us almost nothing about the resurrected Jesus. In chapter 14, the pre-crucifixion Jesus says that after his resurrection he will go to Galilee, giving the post-resurrection Jesus a specific location in space and historical time. This observation is confirmed by the young man at the tomb. The other thing we learn from Mark is that the post-resurrection Jesus somehow involves the disappearance of his body. This is hard to interpret. It seems that Mark meant the resurrected Jesus was his reanimated corpse. Whether that's really what he meant is a question that's kept theologians in business for 2,000 years, and counting. And that's it from Mark. We never get to meet the resurrected Jesus. Someone added a longer ending to Mark after the Gospel of John was written, so I'll address that last. Matthew chapter 28 starts with the two Marys going to the tomb at dawn. An earthquake, an angel shows up, rolls away the stone, sits on it and tells them not to fear for he is risen, shows them where he lay and sends them off to tell the disciples that Jesus is going ahead to Galilee and will see them there. So off they go. Then in verse 8, So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Then Matthew has the guards report, followed by verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, 
but some doubted. Then Matthew ends his Gospel with Jesus' great commission. We learn that you can hold on to the resurrected Jesus' feet. No one has difficulty recognising him, unlike in Luke and John, but some still doubt even when they see him. That's a bit odd. Why do they doubt and how could they be convinced? We're not told, but Luke and John take that up. The Great Commission is the end of the Gospel. There is no final ascent into heaven in Matthew. Luke 24 starts with a variation on women visiting the tomb early and seeing two men in shining clothes, who redirect them to Galilee. Then verse 13. Now that very day two of them disciples were on their way to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and debating these things, Jesus himself approached and began to accompany them but their eyes were kept from recognising him. Then he said to them, What are these matters you are discussing so intently as you walk along? Then they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? He said to them, What things? The things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. A man who with his powerful deeds and words proved to be a prophet before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Not only this, but it is now the third day since these things happened. Furthermore, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and said that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. So he said to them, You foolish people, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. So they approached the village where they were going. He acted as though he wanted to go further, but they urged him, Stay with us, because it is getting towards evening and the day is almost done. So he went in to stay with them. When he had taken his place at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. At this point, their eyes were opened, and they recognised him. Then he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? So they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them gathered together and saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how they had recognised him when he broke the bread. While they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. But they were startled and terrified, thinking they saw a ghost. Then he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It's me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones like you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it, because of their joy, and were amazed, he said to them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in front of them. Then Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and, lifting up his hands, he blessed them, Now, during the blessing, he disappeared and was taken up into heaven. This is pretty weird. Jesus is walking alongside them for seven miles, or about two hours, locked in conversation, and they don't recognise him. Then they sit down to eat with this breaking of the bread Last Supper act. They recognise him, and he vanishes. Then he reappears, and they are terrified and think he's a ghost. He specifically says, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have shows them his wounds, which he invites them to touch, and eats a broiled fish, which sounds rather tasty. After all, at this point he hadn't eaten for, well, at least two days, and that was put in to show that he was real. So our new Jesus is still a kind of walking around person, but he's got a couple of additional powers, one of which is to appear and disappear at will, and the other is disguise. 
In John 20, we have similar shenanigans at the tomb. Then verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she bent down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Mary replied, They have taken my Lord away, and I do not know where they have put him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Because she thought he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus replied, Do not touch me, for I have not yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and tell them, I am going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and informed the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them what Jesus had said to her. What John meant in verse 17 about do not touch me as I have not yet gone up to my father is not clear and has led to much debate. My guess is that it was to do with ritual purity, the dead being impure to touch. Maybe John had in mind an additional step to remove the impurity of death after removing death. If so, it implies something is carried over from the corpse. So perhaps the resurrected Jesus contains what Paul would call corruptible stuff which needs to be removed. Anyway, verse 19, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the disciples had gathered together and locked the doors of the place, because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. If there was an antonym for halitosis, this would be the place to use it. Anyway, verse 24. Now Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he replied, Unless I see the wounds from the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the wounds from the nails, and put my hand in his side, I will never believe it. Eight days later the disciples were again together in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and examine my hands. Extend your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue in your unbelief, but believe. Thomas replied to him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are the people who have not seen me and yet have believed. John is using a plot device here to show the physical nature of the body of the resurrected Jesus by bringing in the doubting Thomas, who would not believe unless he sees and feels the wounds from the nails and spear. John is using a plot device here to show the physical nature of the body of the resurrected Jesus. There is an interesting theological point about the doubting Thomas, and blessed are those who believe and who have not seen, but I think the main purpose here is to persuade the reader that the resurrected Jesus was a real person. Unlike the other Gospels, John isn't finished yet. Verse 21. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, or Galilee. Now, this is how he did so. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel, who was from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of his were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. We'll go with you, they replied. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already very early morning, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you don't have any fish, do you? They replied, No. He told them, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they threw the net and were not able to pull it in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. So Simon Peter, when he heard that it was the Lord, tucked in his outer garment, for he had nothing on underneath it, and plunged into the sea. Meanwhile the other disciples came with the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards. 
When they got out on the beach, they saw a charcoal fire ready with a fish placed on it and bread. Jesus said, Bring some of the fish you have just now caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153, but although there were so many, the net was not torn. Come, have breakfast, Jesus said. But none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they don't initially recognise Jesus, though in this case he was a hundred yards away. We find here that the resurrected Jesus can perform miracles by remote control and can cook. For some reason we are told that they caught 153 large fish. For what reason, I'll leave for another time. That none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? because they knew it was the Lord, is a bit odd. It looks as though John was using a story his readers would recognise, but not associate with Jesus. He added this to explain that discrepancy. John is still not done. There follow Peter's triple affirmations, absolving his triple denial, a prediction of Peter's death and a curious statement from Jesus that if I want John to remain alive until after I return, what is that to you? Immediately followed by a walk back of the comment suggesting that the gospel was written after Peter's death but before John's and updated after John died. There are a couple of appearances of the resurrected Jesus in Acts. He presented himself alive with many convincing proofs. He was seen by them over a 40-day period and spoke about matters concerning the kingdom of God. He told about the coming Holy Spirit and then he ascended up into the clouds. And ever after that he appears in a visionary context, rather like in Paul. Which raises the possibility that the remainder of Acts was written before chapter 1 verses 1 to 11. And finally there is the long ending of Mark. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands... And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. I wonder how many Christians have died as a consequence of verse 18. The amount of information about the post-resurrection Jesus grows from Mark to Matthew to Luke to John and the picture we get is mixed. He appears ghostly or frightening or not recognisable. He disappears then appears again amongst them in a locked room. Then into this rather spectral narrative are inserted verses with the specific intent of persuading the reader that he is a real person, such as having him eat broiled fish getting Thomas to touch his wounds, having Jesus say ghosts do not have flesh and bones as I do. Recall that Matthew had guards placed at the tomb. That was to address the obvious criticism of Mark's version that the body had been stolen. So we know that criticism was circulating at the time. Similarly, these incarnating insertions tell us that the Pauline spiritual resurrected Jesus was still circulating at the time the Gospels were written. Between Paul and the Gospels, we see a change in the resurrected Jesus, from a purely spiritual body incompatible with flesh and bones, revealed through vision, to a physical man walking around with flesh and bones who can eat and be touched. He also has godly powers, the ability to appear and disappear, read minds, pass through locked doors, perform miracles and disguise himself. 
So he hasn't become entirely a man. But neither was the pre-crucifixion Jesus entirely a man. He has come very close to that. I would say at least 90% of the way to the pre-resurrection Jesus. So the question then is, if this process occurred to the post-resurrection Jesus as reported to us by Paul, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John over the period from the 50s to around the turn of the 2nd century, could this same process have occurred to the pre-crucifixion Jesus by the same authors over the same time period? <laughs>